It's something. Uh, dear, dear colleague, uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a very great pleasure and honor for me to announce the ne uh, next last keynote speaker at our conference, Professor Alain Bilsoussan. Professor Alain Bilsoussan he, uh, is Lars Magnus Ericsson Chair and the Director of International Center for Decision and Risk Analysis at the University of Texas in Dallas. He is also professor in Hong Kong. Kong. Uh, he was uh, president of uh, National Institute on Automation and Computer Sciences in Ria. Uh, at that time, I worked in, 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 in Ria. Uh, he was also uh, president of French Space Agency, uh, chairman of European Agency. Uh, uh, Space Agency. He is a member of French Academy of Science, published many books. He is fellow of many professional societies as IEEE, IMSCM. Uh, uh, he obtained many uh, international distinction, distinctions. He is also uh, emeritus professor uh, in the uh, University of Paris Dauphine, France. Uh, Alain also uh, a sort of uh, grandfather for me, scientific grandfather, because Alan was supervisor of Jean-Marie Prot, and Jean-Marie Prot was my advisor and uh, direct, uh, research director. So Alan, it's very great pleasure for me to announce you, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very honored. To speak to uh, this conference, and of course, I am very, uh, uh, very sorry not to be, to be present <laughs> in this beautiful city of Nantes. Uh, you said I was uh, supervisor Jean Marie Prot. I want to dedicate this talk to him. Uh, in fact, uh, it's a very, very case which is relatively rare because the Chavari Prot knew the topic of operations management and much better than me. <laughs> so it is a case where I learned a lot with him and uh, all the people who, have, who know him, students, but also international scholars. There are a few, certainly many in the conference, know how much, how great he was as a scholar and scientist and also as wonderful person to meet, so it was a great loss. And thanks, Alexandre, to have organized a special session in his memory. Okay, so since it is a keynote speech, uh, I decided to talk about a more reflection issue, not a, it's not a technical talk, although there are some technical aspects, mostly connected with a little bit of uh, mechanical engineering and aeronautical engineering, but also mainly about systems engineering. Uh, so it's not really, uh, uh, risk management, I think, is extremely important. Uh, I teach it, but I don't, I'm not, I don't do really research in it because it's not really the field. Uh, some aspect of it, of course, are very quantitative, but what I'm most interested in is, uh, is the global issues of this management. And uh, well, I've taken the case of Boeing because the only thing that I can do in this field is really a case study study and uh, from that point of view, the uh, Boeing case is very important because in so many aspects of what I want to say are, uh, are in, involved in this, in, in, this, in this case, especially the comprehensive aspect of risk management, which is something which is not so much understood, uh, well, understood or uh, uh, not so much aware of that, 
This is very important. Okay, so. Okay. Uh, I will go. I will go over the slides. Probably too much. In fact, risk management is people now. What it is? They, they are. Uh, they, they, uh, there are many many papers in this conference about uh, about that. Uh, but uh, the address probably specific aspect, for instance, uh, in the very interesting the talk of uh, David, uh, he mentioned resiliency. Uh, so about, uh, with respect to, of course, all the, what is happening now with uh, disruptions in supply chains and uh, all issues, so we know we are aware there are many risks like uh, climate change, uh, of the war in Ukraine, well, uh, which is occurring now, uh, cyber security and so on. People are aware that risk is important, but they address only specific aspect, and this is probably uh, something that should be very much emphasized. Uh, risk management, if you don't take it globally and in a comprehensive manner, you miss most of it. So it has consequences in, in for management science. Uh, David mentioned the change of our domain. For instance, when I was uh, personally learning uh, operations research in the 60s and 70s and so on, management science, operations research, was, it was mainly an issue of being efficient. So optimism, we have to optimize because we have limited set of resources and we have to maximize the output. So management science was provided tools like uh, mathematical optimization, mathematical uh, uh, programming, and uh, uh, this, this was the situation. And then something And then it changed. A new wave came of management in, because of finance. In fact, the core issue of management was to, to give the financial results very fast and very much, very uh, intensive, very intense because of the fact that companies more and more were public and uh, on uh, the invest investors are uh, pension funds and so on. These people want to have a lot of money very fast. So the issue was to reduce cost, to cut cost, uh, and to, to provide the results, financial results. And also uh, something connected to that is the way CEOs are, are uh, Incentive for CEOs are mainly on the results of uh, the company, and that contributes to this race for financial success. Boeing, which was uh, obviously a top engineering uh, company, sense, and uh, was affected by that, and from uh, being top in engineering, uh, and, uh, they wanted to become top in the obtaining results. And this is part of the story. So this is the second wave. And uh, I speak of wave because of COVID, of course. The second wave of, uh, for us, the consequence is that people move from production management and so on to, to finance. And we have mathematical finance in particular, and uh, financial engineering options, credit, uh, credit uh, so it was a boom of uh, modeling for finance. I think uh, this is passed in particular thanks to, uh, thanks to the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, and now the risk is, as I said, probably uh, uh, 
very important matter. But my main message is that it, sh it should be at the core of what is management now. Uh, okay. Okay, so, so since, so I will skip the reasons of that. And uh, my talk will be about not the risk like climate change or uh, resiliency and so on, because these are known. These are known, there are difficulties, there are external risks which affect maybe a uh, company, a corporation, but they are known. I want to talk about risks which are not known. Uh, and when I say not known, I mean we are not conscious of that, of them, because they are of human behavior and nature. So they affect any of us, so individuals, but they affect companies, corporations uh, as well, and maybe nations, and governments, it's, it's true, but in our case, it, that affects corporation, and that's what I want to emphasize because it's not so much, uh, we are not aware of that. Some people outside could be aware, but the victims themselves are not aware and they are not conscious. Of them. And it's very, so that's why we have to say something as scholars and, uh, and uh, scientists to help. So let's, let's, let's like that. And Boeing case, uh, there is most of that. Most of that. And uh, in particular, he's here I'm reviewing that issue of safety, of course. Safety. But safety, uh, we are now living with very complex systems. Uh, in the future, we'll have autonomous system, we have connected system, and what is safety in this context is, is an issue. Strategic risk, what is uh, survivability, the issue of leadership, and so on, the issue of trust. Trust because of complexity, uh, if you have, you have to be very careful about the maintaining trust. Design and development. We speak about production management, but design and development of products, especially innovative products and so on, like the plane in particular, are now most of the issue. Communication. Because of complexity of system, we have to train people. They, they must be competent. They must understand. Uh, the complexity of the system they are using. The regulation, what? How regulation can, must be a player in this business because, because the public, the large public is concerned. It's of course, it's obviously true in aeronautics or, or energy, it is true in, uh, in, uh, social networks, we know that. So this is to show how the thing is totally, if you don't handle that globally, in a global manner, you miss the point. So it's hard to, uh, to speak about it, but I will say it's, you need a culture of risk management at all stage of the life cycle and the company, otherwise disastrous decision will occur, really disaster, disaster. Okay, so let's enter, you uh, know there was some problem with Boeing, I'm sure some people are aware, uh, light accident, it's much more than that. That's, it's, uh, it's important to, to try to Look at it a little bit carefully. So this is a plane which crashed. Fortunately, it crashed. The plane crashed. Lion Air on 
October 29, 2018. He was flying from Jakarta to Penang and he crashed 12 minutes after the takeoff. And the result is 189 dead people. The airplane was a Boeing 737 Max 8. Okay, you can say an accident, curse, the curse, not so many, fortunately, the curse. And then life went on, and then we had. Second crash. Ethiopian Airlines, VO2, crashed on March, 10 of March 2019. A flight from Addis Ababa to Nairobi. Six minutes after takeoff, 157 dead. Same aircraft. So, something very surprising. The, uh, between. And the point is that, in fact, this crash would have been avoided completely, prevented. So, not only they were predictable, but, and the reason is not technical, the reason is risk management. The consequence, let's look first at the consequence, immediate consequence. That's what has done. Of course, too much, too much. Not the next day, China grounded the plane. Uh, the next day, Europe grounded the plane, and the U.S. grounded it one day after. Okay, so finished. Let's look at the consequences. For us, the immediate consequences: terrible loss of people, 346 innocent people, that because in an airplane there is no 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 way if there is an accident, a crash. Everybody dies. But if you look at Boeing, the consequence for Boeing, they are terrible. Why? Because this plane is a flagship of Boeing. Uh, it's a new plane. I'll explain that. It's a new plane. And to, 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 to go fast, it will, it will represent, it's supposed to represent more than one third one third of the revenue of Boeing in the next five years. So, so it's not just an ordinary plane. Uh, it's, the, it's really the plane. <laughs> and if you, and it was at the beginning, so they had a lot of orders for this plane because it's a very important uh, market. And they were producing. And if you stop production, Immediately, when you stop, you reduce production rate, or you stop it, then when you resume, the production cost will be much higher, so it will cut profitability a lot. It never occurred in the history of planes. There were only two, two cases where the planes were grounded, but only for short time, only for short time. This founded more than two years. So it's a financial disaster, uh, which probably will cost Boeing uh, $80 billion. $80 billion. Uh, and they are, they are, it's a trap, they have no choice, because crapping the plane now is probably something like $400 billion. So that's where they are. Why is all that? It's a very interesting market where there are only two competitors. Boeing, so this is a market, not, to, not market, it's a market in, inside continents. So North America, uh, Europe, China, Asia, part of Asia, not intercontinental flights. So uh, that's where the money is. Uh, and uh, they are mostly, and there are two planes basically, the Boeing 737 and the Airbus 320. And these guys, these two companies are 
competing fiercely on this market, but competing to reduce to reduce consumption, or because this is mainly the one of the point where you can reduce cost. And what happened? Very interesting. Uh, what happens is that in December first, two thousand ten, Airbus made made an announcement that they have a new version of uh, a Airbus three twenty called the Airbus three twenty Neo new engine option, which will be six percent less fuel than the competitor. Boeing NG, which is a predecessor of Max. And immediately it was a fantastic success. And the next summer, in 2011, in Paris, air show, the bus sold a record number of flights. So in a week, they, they, they sold more than one year of Boeing. Uh, Orders of this 737. That was a terrible shock to Boeing. And what is it? And then comes the big issues. So, so here you have a timetable, and here you see. So in June 2011, Paris Air Show, this was selling the plane, which did not yet exist, <laughs> like crazy. So we had to do something. And then they had to do something extremely fast. In two months, they announced the competitor, the new Boeing 737 MAX. In two months. And then in two years, they completed in uh, four years the first plane has left factory. Certification came very fast by the Federal Aviation Administration in the US, the Europeans, everybody, and the first customer. So the plane started to be operational in, in 2017 and one year after the crash in Lyon. So it has been flying one year before the crash, and flying after the crash, until the second crash, OK? So, so that's one of the immediate issues. So if you do extremely fast to react, that's a big, 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 big problem. OK. So as people, like people, People are, are their ego, Boeing, do not accept that Airbus become the leader. <laughs> Even transitory leader, but that was not acceptable. So they rush immediately. The interesting thing is that why did they, they know they should know? Because there is only one competitor. So that's the main major thing. You have to anticipate the decision of your competitor. Otherwise, that's a major issue in risk. And in a case where it's extremely interesting because all is about the new engines. The engines, is, uh, the, that's where the consumption falls. So the, you change the engine. Ooh, ooh. The engines are not done by the by Boeing or, or others. They are done by engine manufacturers. In fact, there is one, only one engine manufacturer here, General Electric, Safran, the team. And they provide the engines to both, to Boeing as well as to Airbus. So you see, they are only one provider, and the engine is the same technology. Of course, it's totally separate within, the, within the General Electric and Safran. It's totally separate, the two. But it's the same company, and it's the same technology. But still, the engines are totally separate, and this is secret. So the only secret is when to decide. When is the decision to take, to start the development of the plane? So that's the key thing. So that 
for you miss, which was just a big mistake in such, uh, such an issue. Okay, and then they wanted to go very fast. You cannot, this is, this is a dosage theorem of risk management. If you want to reduce time, you want to reduce cost, then you increase risk. And this is a recipe for disaster. So in a matter of weeks, they decided, decided to use a 737 Y because why? We don't, we will, let, let me tell you why, because it's not for one reason. Because if he, if he had a new plane, if he had a new plane, then it will cost a lot in terms, because it, a lot to get certification, approval of his plane. When you have a new plane, the certification process is extremely long and you have to train pilots, you have to train everybody. So the, the, the point is, this is not a new plane. It will be very efficient, but not new. By the command woman, then it could not. But the 737 is not a new plane. Okay, the platform is not new, but changing the engines is something completely new because this is a plane which was in the 60s. So you want to have this plane as competitive as the new planes, and you have a plane from the 60s, you cannot pretend it is the same plane. That's what we try to pretend, because they wanted the certification extremely fast and light training of flight pilots. They were obsessed by that. This, they were taking extremely huge risk and I mean, what I'm saying, they are not conscious of that, although it's totally clear when you think a little bit, but, but that's, what, that's what, when I'm saying you are, you are blind for this type of, you don't know them, you don't want to look at them. That's a terrible thing, terrible thing that you are entering into disaster. Okay, so here is a statement by an expert. Uh, the bit, the need that it was just a 737, because uh, they wanted to say it's not a new plane, it's the same. So then the certification process is very fast, and then you, you, you save millions of dollars and you like training, you don't have to train people. That's a big mistake. Okay, and then they started to accumulate, because when you start this, you accumulate. Please, you accumulate mistakes, and then it's worse and worse. So we immediately try to use communication uh, and to commit themselves in, uh, in saving, and it worked, because they know how to communicate. So they were selling like crazy, like others, and they were selling the plane without being able to commit the, okay? For instance, uh, in terms of training, the chief pilot, this guy Ed Wilson, boasted that pilots who knew the 737 could fit to the max in just two and a half hours of computer-based training. Okay? Now then comes a little bit of technique. Technical, uh, what is a problem? Technical problem here. It's a problem of system engineering. It's important to, to understand it. So uh, just, uh, I said it was, they have the same supplier. So the engine is called the EAP-1B, B is for Boeing. So for this is the LEAP-1A. Okay. So that's, uh, okay, just for the fun. Okay, so because the engine is much bigger, uh, and uh, in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, plane, it's all the, the, the engines are all very low. So you, they could not put this, the new engine in the same 
position. So they move it. They move it forward and slightly higher on the wing of the max. And that creates aerodynamics problems. Aerodynamics problems. Okay? And stability and so on. And the issue called lift, which implies a behavior which is different than the previous versions. But supposedly, according to their calculation, only when the plane was climbing very steeply. So they thought that it was all very rare and very rare. And uh, the issue is when you have a high angle of attack, a plane comes into stalling, which of course is a disaster because you, you cannot control it. Uh, but people, people think it's a matter of stability to have a stable plane. Stability is not the issue by itself. In other words, planes are not stable or unstable. Uh, they, could be unstable they could be unstable purposely to increase maneuverability. For instance, the fighter jets. They are very unstable because they, the, they, we want, they want to have very maneuverable and the pilots are trained to control the plane. So it's not something in absolute. So it can be controlled, but of course, what you ask for a uh, commercial plane is not what you ask for a fight culture. So it's not the fact that uh, this plane is unstable and uh, dangerous because it was a new plane and they wanted to say it is not a new plane, <laughs> to say it more, but simple as that. Uh, okay? So they, they decide, to, so basically they should have changed the platform, modified the platform, so the platform was not adapted. Okay, but they decide to keep the same platform, the 737, and they decide to go to a solution on software instead of hardware. If not, maybe it doesn't mean it is a bad idea. It would have been better to change the platform, but it's very costly. So software can do the job. But if you start using software, you are extremely, you have to be extremely careful. Well, and you enter into what is called embedded software. It's not a software issue, it's a system issue. OK? And they use this software, MCAS, which was used for military, Boeing, and the, the OK, I, I see I've got uh, uh, running short of time. So anyway, so they, they let me skip all of that. If you're interested, you can get. This is the way the, the, the software works. If you have an angle of attack, uh, which is uh, rises, then the sensor uh, did not, uh, notice that and orders the little software to automatically uh, lift the plane's tail, and then when it is okay, then uh, you can resume. So that's, in theory, it's very simple. In practice, it's completely different. Okay, so I have to I have to go fast. So, so let me uh, let me skip all of that. Sorry. So. So when you the issue of embedded software, it's very important to understand that. So it's not an issue of software. It's not the fact that there is a bug in the software. Software is fine, but you have to understand how we, the software behaves within the system. So it is embedded. And it's not trivial at all, because uh, it's, a, it's a very important field of research in software engineering and uh, computer science in general to prove, to prove mathematically how the software will behave. Uh, they did not do that, anything of that. They, they had a supplier for software. They asked the supplier to, to, to write the software. The supplier wrote the software. Nobody 
to care about the fact how the software will behave in the system, which is a terrible mistake of basic risk management. And something which is clearly something very hard to understand. They use one sensor, and of course the software thinks that the sensor gives the right information. But the sensor can fail. <laughs> That's exactly what occurred in the Indonesian flight. And probably in the Ethiopian flight also, the sensor did, gave wrong information. And uh, that's why the plane was working OK one, during one year. And then all of a sudden, because of the wrong information, there was a crash. So nobody can see that. Nobody pays attention to the fact that the sensor can, be, can give wrong information. OK, warnings were not taken into consideration. And then, uh, I, how long do, how much do I have? Can someone tell me how much? Hello? How much do I have? Five, five minutes. A minute. Okay, let me let me finish. There are a lot of stuff here, and it concerns also SAA. Okay, let me finish all of that, and I want to to give a main message because all because of all of that. There has been an investigation by the Congress of the United States, a very, very serious investigation and very, very important report, which I read carefully. And uh, they had so many hiring, <laughs> hearings and uh, a lot of pages of reports and so on. But in my view, they are not telling what is the main thing. They, they were extremely critical on Boeing, extremely critical on FAA, about the production, well, a lot of issues. The fact that Boeing missed the safety. Uh, and in response about what did you learn about all of that? Boeing said that they are changing several organizations, they made some several organizational changes and they enhance safety. They, they don't speak about the comprehensive risk approach they miss completely, and they still don't get the point. So here's uh, what the committee says. Both Boeing and FAA share responsibility for the development and ultimate certification of an aircraft that was unsafe, which is not true as uh, such. Both must learn critical lessons from this tragic accident to improve the certification process, and the FAA must dramatically amplify and improve its oversight of Boeing, while the change that FAA and Boeing have proposed will be the start of a long process, changing the fundamental culture issues that led to an amendment that permitted Boeing to build and FAA to certify the technological faulty aircraft would take much longer. So at no, no, we, we don't get the main point, okay? So it was, uh, what is the situation now to conclude? Anyway, they corrected this thing because you can, you can solve the problem, but now I don't know about the profitability of the, the plane because it has cost so much. And uh, now the plane is cleared by, by FAA, then the Europeans, and they all, uh, all countries, and finally China decide to, <laughs> which is a little bit strange, decide to, to, uh, to clear the, the plane, but only January 2020. So now the plane supposedly can fly, but who trusts that? <laughs> so easy plane will be. So, it, so the conclusion is that. I think it's striking, the word, even the word risk management does not appear anywhere. The word secu safety, security, it's mentioned, but not risk management. So, and not appear in the Congress investigation, 
So that's my message. In other words, we are missing here the point that the company, everything should be, the core should be a risk management in a comprehensive manner. And uh, I'm not sure that it is sufficiently well understood. I guess can, scholar academic people like us have to do something on that. So, okay, so I think uh, probably I'm almost completed my time. I don't know if there is any question. No, if, he may, if uh, someone is, of course, interested in that, then uh, we'd be very happy to enter the discussion because, as I said, it's not my, my field of basic knowledge. I'm learning it because uh, it's very uh, small, uh, as I said, uh, human behavior, organization theory, leadership, and so on, which are not my major fields. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. And if you have questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Alain. Thank you very much. We have two minutes for uh, some questions. Okay. Do you have questions? I hope you heard me well. Yeah. 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 We, we hear you. No question? The... Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alain. Thank you very much for, for this talk. We have uh, two minutes for small questions. Thomas? Thank you very much for this good uh, summary here. I was not aware of that. Do you have any indications what Airbus did in this case on their side? So is there any further risk management or risk intelligence established at Airbus? Well, <laughs> They are not happy with the situation. You could think they are happy. To, they would be very happy because it's a, it's a competition between only two two monopoles. They are not happy with that. So, because to some extent, uh, it reduces the trust in, in planes, <laughs> right? So, and uh, so in Europe, for instance, people maybe will use more of a train than planes. Because, as I said, it's not international, so international, you have no choice. But inside, inside Europe, you can take the train. Less in the United States, in China also, you may take the plane. Uh, the plane. So they are, they are not so happy. They, uh, that, from my knowledge, uh, because what happened to their competitor, they, of course, they are not, uh, they are leader now, <laughs> but, uh, which is something, and, uh, and uh, they will uh, do, well, I don't know exactly how they react, that's to, to tell the point, I don't have a specific contact with them, only very remote, uh, and what they say, they, of course, everybody always come and say safety, 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 safety. Does it change the way they, they, hope they, they decide the decision of future prod products and so on? The others have a failure also. And uh, you may, uh, if you are European, you know the Airbus 380, which was uh, the big plane, inter this international, uh, international, yeah, intercontinental. So big plane, which was supposed to carry 800 passengers. Boeing didn't make this mistake. Uh, they did not believe in that. So Airbus, and it was a beautiful plane. I remember I visited this plane and so on. It's, it has been an economic failure. Airbus lost money on this plane. They stopped the production. So, so they made a mistake, an economic mistake. Here, it was not a reaction. They believe in, in these very big planes with a lot of passengers because of the uh, issue of hubs. Uh, they, they thought that the air traffic will be organized with hubs, big hubs and between hubs. You have these very, uh, very big planes, and it was a mistake. So, mistake can occur. You have, we, we have, we, we have to live with that. It, we cannot be immune. Uh, but you must be very organized. So they did not, in the case of AFP-AT, they lost money, and they stopped it. They decided to finish. And that's it. So they lost some money, but not a big money, not too much, because an economic mistake, like uh, in the past, of course, the Concorde, 
Thank you, Alan. The second question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Alan, for a very insightful talk and uh, changing sort of the paradigm from cost uh, to to financial efficiency to risk management. And uh, I think we somewhat kind of sort of know how to deal with the characterized uncertainty in terms of stochastic work. But uh, one comment I'd like you, you to share about uh, black swan events, uh, if you could. So uh, how could we do risk management under black swan events? Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, deep. <laughs> the... So my, my, yeah, so very important question. And my friend Taleb, who <laughs> invented the, the word, uh, so it doesn't really exist. In other words, small. So there are many examples. I, I, I have many cases. I try to collect cases. Uh, the, the Fukushima accident is also a very interesting case. Uh, so what you say, black swans exist. Okay, okay, it exists. So you cannot avoid uh, this thing. So. The philosophy is you mitigate uh, as much as possible, you mitigate risk as much as possible, yeah. but you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, eliminate them. And then you have to be prepared. When they occur, you have to be the best prepared to uh, handle the consequence uh, of the, of the habits. Uh, if you look at the issues like uh, what occurred, of course, uh, the, war, the war in Ukraine is a rare event, fortunately, but it occurred. And we were not prepared to that, right? And we are, uh, now we are learning lessons that do, in terms of what happens to us. Thank you, Alan. Uh, unfortunately, the session will start. So thank you, thank you very much for your uh, keynote talk. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. You, you can join your session. Uh, the session uh, starts now. Uh, thank you, Alain.